Section 5 of The Age of Anne by Edward Ellis Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Opening of the War. Section 1 Marlborough in Flanders. Immediately upon the declaration of war, Marlborough was appointed commander in chief of the British forces. Fortunately, the Dutch also were easily persuaded by Hensius to place their troops under the same command. Indeed, Marlborough became almost at once exceedingly popular with the Dutch people, as well as honoured and trusted by the Dutch statesmen. His exquisite manners account for the popularity. William's opinion of him for the trust. The standing danger of a confederacy is division of councils, and it was therefore well for the common cause that the troops of both the Dutch and the English, the most important of the allies in that quarter, should be under one general. The fact that there were more commanders than one ruined the campaigns elsewhere, on the Rhine and in Spain. But it was unfortunate that the confidence of the Dutch did not go so far as the abolition of their custom of sending with the general field deputies civilian members of the government, without whose consent no important action should be undertaken. This was no special device to annoy Marlborough, but in his early campaigns it had the effect of hindering him and tying his hands. It must be remembered that immediately on his grandson's accepting the Spanish crown, Louis had seized all the strong towns in the Spanish Netherlands and occupied them with French troops. Many of these were fortresses of the first rank, and their fortifications had been repaired by Vauban. Until Marlborough and the Allies could wrest these from him, there could be no security for Holland from a French invasion. Before Marlborough arrived to take the command of the United Army, the town of Kaiserwerth upon the Rhine, which was under the Elector of Cologne, one of France's few allies, had been taken. Marlborough's object was, starting from this town, to clear as much as he could of the Netherlands. He laid siege to and captured several towns. At Fenlo, the first of them, much gallantry was displayed in an attack upon a fort. One young English nobleman, who had risen from a sick bed, offered every farthing he had to the man who would lift him over the palisades. There was no resisting such a spirit. The town itself soon capitulated, its surrender being hastened by an accident. The besiegers received orders to fire a salute in honor of a victory which the Allies had won upon the Rhine. The defenders thought it was the commencement of a general attack, and they yielded at once. Liege was the seat of an independent prince-bishop, but it did not on that account escape its share of war. The French had placed a garrison in it, and the Allies took it by storm. The result of this first campaign of Marlborough was that he cleared from French occupation a wedge, with Liege as its apex, the Rhine as its base, and the Meuse as one of its sides, and that he had cut the French off from the lower valley of the Rhine, and thereby protected the Dutch frontier at one of its most vulnerable parts. At the conclusion of this campaign, Marlborough was very near being taken prisoner. The boat in which he was proceeding down the Meuse was seized by some Frenchmen, and he himself was only saved by the quick wit of his servant, who put into his hand an old passport belonging to his brother. The news of this supposed capture spread the greatest consternation through Holland, where his services were beginning to be appreciated, and great was the joy when it was discovered that the capture had not been effected. In honor of his services, Marlborough was made a duke, and a solemn te deum was played in St. Paul's Cathedral, the queen attending in all state. It was the first real check for many years that the French had received. The campaign of the second year was by no means so successful. The French were concentrating their strength on their efforts in other parts, but Marlborough was unable to use his opportunity because he was hampered by the field deputies and by Dutch colleagues, nominally his subordinates. One of these generals distinguished himself by running away from the enemy 
and himself bringing news that his own troops were cut to pieces when the truth was that relieved of his presence they had fought bravely even if they had not actually won a victory marlborough's own wish was to make a bold attack on antwerp but by these thwartings he was prevented from carrying out his design the results of his campaign therefore were meagre but he managed to widen the base of his triangular wedge by the capture of bunn on the rhine and to drive it a little further home by the capture of the fortress of huy which is higher up the meuse valley than liege being about halfway to namur at the close of that year the archduke charles on his way to spain paid a visit to the low countries and afterwards to england he presented marlborough with his portrait and with a sword set in diamonds thus early in the war must charles have recognized that almost his only hope of success lay in marlborough's generalship section two campaigns in germany and elsewhere besides marlborough's first campaign in the low countries there was also fighting elsewhere in the first year of the war on the upper rhine prince louis of baden succeeded in taking the town of lando which was held by the french it was in honour of this that the salute was being fired which led to the capture of fenlo prince louis was a soldier of the old school personally brave but very difficult to set in motion very crotchety about the rules of tactics and not apt to imbibe new ideas about them he was shortly after this beaten by a french marshal there was fighting also in italy where the allied troops were commanded by prince eugene mantua and milan had both declared for philip of anjou and it was necessary for eugene to offer battle in order to secure the imperial interests in north italy he won a brilliant victory at cremona in which the french general was taken prisoner by this he protected the empire for a time from any invasion by way of the italian passes into tyrol in the second year of the war louis and his war minister seem to have resolved to make a vigorous attack upon the empire the empire was the weakest of the allies because the territories of the empire lay most exposed to attack an army was sent to cooperate with the elector of bavaria who had now declared in favour of france it had no difficulty in escaping from louis of baden and then by marching through the black forest it effected a junction with the elector of bavaria a campaign in tyrol ensued in which the capital innsbruck and the strong fortress of kufstein commanding the brenner pass were captured by the bavarians but the peasantry rose against the invaders and they were forced to retire a battle was fought at hochstadt close by the field where marlborough defeated the french next year but the imperialists were routed another french army retook lando so that the general result of the campaign in germany was very favourable to the french meanwhile in another quarter the english had been engaged in a fight which did not add lustre to their honour admiral benbow was a brave old sailor popular with his men but hated by his officers whom he kept to their work he was acting against a french squadron in the west indies and making a most gallant fight which he would have won if he had not been deserted by some of his captains he was himself struck by several shots and mortally wounded but he survived long enough to bring the traitors to court-martial two of them were shot for cowardice and one dismissed from the service but it was believed that the reason of their conduct was as much hatred of their admiral as fear of the enemy's cannonballs. Section 3. Spain. It was to be expected that in a war which was about Spain, an expedition would be made against Spain itself. King William had planned an expedition against Cadiz, once the scene of a great English triumph, when Essex singed the King of Spain's beard and it was determined now to carry out this plan cadiz was called the golden gate of the indies because all the wealth of the mines in spanish america entered europe there the spaniards were very weak they were without money and without troops if the english had made a vigorous and well-directed effort they would probably have taken cadiz the command of the force was given to the duke of ormond 
who had in William's battles shown great bravery, but who had not the faculty of commanding. The navy was entrusted to a gallant sailor, Sir George Rook. A contingent of Dutch troops were employed under a Dutch general. But Ormond was wholly unable to preserve discipline, and national jealousy led to disturbances between the English and the Dutch. The orders were not very clear, and Rook made merry over them. They were to conciliate the Spaniards to the cause of Charles, by making an attack on their towns. The Spaniards armed themselves under a brave old nobleman, the Marquis of Villa Darias, who, having but few troops wherewith to defend Cadiz, resorted to the expedient of lighting watch-fires sufficient for a large force, and so deceived the allies. Two small towns were taken, but the men could not be restrained from plundering them, shamelessly firing even the churches in their Protestant fury. Thus, instead of conciliating, they roused the fierce hostility of the Spaniards. After a month, a council of war decided that the enterprise should be abandoned. Fortunately for the credit of England, on the voyage home a chance was offered for the fleet to distinguish itself. News was brought that the yearly fleet of Spanish galleons laden with treasure had put into Vigo Bay. The law of Spanish trade was that these galleons should unload only at Cadiz. As the English fleet was in front of Cadiz, they had taken refuge at Vigo. If they could have received permission to unload, all the treasure might have been saved for Spain. The jealous officials at Cadiz, however, refused this permission, and although the higher authorities at Madrid granted it, it arrived only after a delay that proved fatal. The Spaniards at Vigo placed a boom or barrier of masts and spars across the mouth of the harbor, where they also manned two small forts. The hope of plunder and the desire to recover the reputation which they had lost before Cadiz stimulated the Allies to great efforts at Vigo. Whilst the English soldiers under Ormond scaled and took the forts, a gallant sea-fight ensued in which victory fell to the English. The ships charged and broke the boom. It is uncertain what became of the greater part of the treasure. Enough fell into the hands of the assailants to reward them for their enterprise. There were some who think that the remainder still lies at the bottom of Vigo Harbour, but others argue that the interval which elapsed between the appearance of the Allies and their attack was sufficient to enable much of it to be landed and removed into the interior. The English government did not send any expedition into Spain in the next year, but tried first by means of diplomacy to attach the King of Portugal to the cause of the Grand Alliance and of the Archduke Charles. When they had at length succeeded in this, it was determined to attack Spain at the same time from the east and the west. The army from the west consisted of Portuguese levies and English troops. It did not do much until the command was given to the Earl of Galway, a French Protestant, who, escaping from the intolerance of France, had been honoured with a commission in the English army by King William, and later with an Irish peerage. He had already earned a reputation for bravery at the Battle of the Boyne, and possessed a certain amount of military skill, but he lacked the power of adapting his skill to new circumstances. Strange to say, whilst the Allied army was commanded by a Frenchman, the army that was opposed to it was commanded by an Englishman, for against Portugal Louis had sent a large army into Spain to help to fight the battles of his grandson. This force he placed under the Duke of Berwick, the illegitimate son of James II and Arabella Churchill, Marlborough's sister, a cold, stern man and an excellent general. Meanwhile, Sir George Rook had been making an attempt upon the opposite coast of Spain. He had prepared to make an attack on Barcelona, an important commercial city, and one that was believed to have much sympathy with the Archduke. But the troops which he had on board were insufficient, and the malcontents in the city, who had expected a large force and the presence of the Archduke himself, were disappointed. Rook, therefore, was obliged to retire. As the force was returning, a very important place fell almost by accident into the hands of the English. Gibraltar was not then the strong place that the art of fortification has made it since, but it was always very strong by nature. 
so strong that the Spaniards left but a small garrison there, and that garrison was careless in its watching. Rook determined to make an attempt on Gibraltar, and landed some troops on the narrow strip of land by which the rock of Gibraltar is connected with the mainland. The day after the bombardment commenced was a saint's day, and the sentinels went to hear mass in a neighboring chapel. Whilst they were thus employed, some English sailors clambered by a path, which was almost inaccessible, on to the top of the rock, and there hoisted the British flag. In spite of vigorous efforts on the part of enemies to haul it down, that flag has waved over the rock of Gibraltar from that day, 3rd of August, 1704, to this. End of section 5